and hopefully we can get that resolved. I want to go ahead and get started here. Um, got a little bit of a different kind of sermon this morning. Um, if you think about it, since finishing the book of Colossians about five weeks ago now, uh, I've been preaching topically, and I said that I would be preaching topically here for, um, for a while. You guys haven't... Weird. So it's online, but not in-house? Okay. So I'm going to keep going, and hopefully we can get that figured out. Um, as I was saying, I've been preaching topically for about the last four weeks, and for two weeks, the first two weeks, I was talking about um, <clears throat> Colossians, uh, I'm sorry, after we finished Colossians, I talked about Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, and we spent two weeks talking about that. And then here more recently, I've spent two weeks talking about the issue of born again or regenerated. Is there a difference? And we've been looking at some things in John 3 and in Titus chapter 3 and trying to make some comparisons about those sorts of things. This morning, I want to address a topic that um, when I tell you the title, you're going to be like, what in the world is that? And I titled it that way on purpose so that you would ask, what in the world is that? Um, and the topic and the title that I have this morning is titled Truth and censorship, truth and censorship in post-Athenian America, truth and censorship in post-Athenian America. I want to share with you some things that have been on my mind for a long time. Uh, obviously, I don't talk about politics. I try to make it a rule in church not to talk about politics for the most part because people will have their fill of politics. They can hear anything they want, and nobody really cares what I think anyway about any of this stuff. And you should have your own opinions uh, formulated based on the Word of God. And church, to me, is the place where we lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and seek to edify the saints on the basis of sound doctrine. But that being said, the culture, we minister in a culture. Go to 2 Corinthians 5 to start with. We have all been given a ministry of reconciliation as members of the church, the body of Christ. And the fact is, is that we live in a culture. We can't necessarily control the culture that we live in. There are aspects about it that are outside of our control. I would say most of it is. And there are forces. The course of this world is at work, and it is setting an agenda and a course that the world is on, and it obviously impacts our culture. Our job as members of the body of Christ, our job as saints today living in the dispensation of grace, is to be ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We are here in His stead. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. If you are a believer today, do you have a ministry? The ministry that you have is the ministry of reconciliation. Next verse. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Okay? And then he says, and, the, and as though God did beseech you, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Folks, where is Jesus Christ today? Right now, on, what is it, uh, March 20th, 2021, 2022, excuse me, where is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is ascended far above all heavens. He's far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, and is he seated at the right hand of God the Father. That's where he is physically. That's where he is geographically right now, right? And in the meantime, in his stead, in his place, are we left here as ambassadors for him to represent him here on planet earth? Okay, Is there coming a day when he will return in the heavens to catch away the church unto himself? Okay, That is the event we refer to as the rapture or the catching away of the church, right? But until he appears in heaven with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ rise first and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet him in the air until that happens are we left here on planet earth in his stead with a ministry and an ambassadorship that he's given us to fulfill okay so anything I'm going to say this morning is said from the premise and from the framework of our ambassadorship not from the premise of politics 
Okay, I want to be clear about that here at the beginning. However, we are here on planet Earth. And as we are here right now on planet Earth, are there things happening in the culture, in society, that we have to wrestle with as ambassadors of Christ if we're going to be effective in our ambassadorship? Okay, And so that is sort of what I want to talk about here this morning. How, this, how we should think about these things. And I'm going to be honest, and I know I'm not going to shock anybody here who knows me, but I'm probably not going to finish this today, which I know you're all going to be you know, super surprised by. It's probably going to be a few-part thing as we talk about this issue. What I want to talk to you about this morning is the issue of troop, truth and censorship in post-Athenian America. Come with me over to, you still got Acts, come over to John 17. Come with me over to John 17. Folks, there is... A major problem in we, when, when it comes to ambassadorship, there is a major problem that we are facing right now, and this is a cultural problem, but it's also a ministry problem, all right? And the ministry problem and cultural problem that we're facing is the breakdown and the understanding of truth. In our culture today, there is no truth. Truth is relative. Truth is individually determined. We have lost all understanding of the idea of absolute and objective truth, all right? And we look here at John chapter 17. John chapter 17, look at verse 17. Notice what Christ says here. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Now, how does he define that? What's the next phrase say? Thy word is what? Truth. The absolute objective standard and authority of truth on this planet is God's word, okay? Now, you know right away now, if you're going to now step out into the marketplace of ideas, into cultural 21st century America, holding forth the idea that thy word is truth, that truth is absolute, and that absolute truth is found in the word of God and in the scripture, are you probably going to be encountering some opposition and some problems? I mean, we haven't even started talking yet about the resurrection, about the death of Christ, just the fundamental premise that there is such a thing as truth is wildly questioned in our day, okay? And, you know, you hear things in the media, et cetera, people talking about fake news or misinformation and all of these sorts of things. When I hear that stuff, I just like, I almost laugh because Fake news and misinformation have been the forte of the adversary for 6,000 years, okay? His fundamental premise when he came to Adam and Eve to Eve in the garden was to question what God said. His first words recorded out of the adversary's mouth in your Bible are, yea, hath God what? Said. And so Satan has been peddling in misinformation and fake news, etc., from the very beginning in the garden when he first comes on the scene. Okay, so what we're dealing with, Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, there's nothing new under what? Under the sun, right? We are dealing with the same fundamental things. They just show up differently in history at different times. Okay, so I'm sure you're familiar, you're all familiar with the term cancel culture. So I have three definitions. I pulled these off the internet this morning, okay? Definition number one, the practice or tendency... This is from Merriam-Webster's online dictionary. The practice or tendency of engaging in mass canceling as a way of expressing disapproval or exerting social pressure. So you don't say, you say something somebody doesn't like, and then they're, they're threatening to do what? Cancel you, right? You say, something, something, uh, you say something somebody doesn't like, and they want to cancel you. They want to shut you off, all right? Interestingly enough, we had an issue this week on our church website with the PayPal donation button. It wasn't working. We couldn't get it working, and we started to wonder, had we been canceled? Had our account been shut down because somebody didn't like something I said? So this is a very real thing that is out there, right? A second definition of cancel culture is a contemporary phrase used to refer to obstructionism in which somebody is thrust out of social or professional circles, whether it be online or social media or in person. Those subject to this ostracism are said to have been, quote, canceled. The expression cancel culture has most most negative connotations 
as it is used in debates on free speech and censorship, and that's from Wikipedia. They also say there on Wikipedia that the, the notion of cancel culture is a variant of the term call-out culture, and it is often said to take the form of boycotting or shunning an individual or group or celebrity or what have you if they have done an action that is deemed unacceptable. Okay? And then a third definition from the Cambridge Online Dictionary is the following. Cancel culture, a way of behaving in a society or group, especially on social media, uh, in which it is common to completely reject and stop supporting somebody because they have said or done something that offends you. Okay? Now, I don't know if you spend any time on social media, but people are offended all the time about all sorts of stuff. Some of it could be, you could argue, is legitimate. Some of it is just silly. You know, I have the wrong shade of blue on and the tie doesn't match, so somebody's mad. You know, my belt doesn't match my shoes, so somebody's upset. Now, it can go, it can go from serious things all the way to just dumb, stupid, mundane things that people are just mad about, okay? So there's a spectrum there of things. And we've all seen and heard this and heard of people being canceled, etc., for allegedly having the wrong view on any number of issues. I have a list of issues. I'm not going to get into them. I'm just going to read you the list of issues that has led to people being canceled. Somebody has the wrong view of masks, vaccines, lockdowns, human sexuality, uh, racial issues, politics, religion, elections, war. Any number of those could lead to you being what? Canceled, okay, in our modern current space. So we're living in a time, folks, where the media is being weaponized to silence people who are not properly advancing the narrative of the the hour in the ascribed manner or with the perceived appropriate level of vitriol. So there's a few different issues there, right? There's number one, if you are opposing whatever they say the narrative is, or you are not standing forth with the perceived appropriate amount of vitriol in your denial or denunciation or whatever this topic is. I'm trying to keep this very general here, okay? But what this means, though, is that the very nature of truth is under attack. If you stand up in the public space and you say, I believe in the Bible's definition of marriage, that marriage is between a man and a woman, are you going to be in danger of being canceled? Yes. If you stand up in a public space and you say, I believe that male and female created he them, are you going to be in danger of being canceled? Okay. We're not just talking here about racial issues and issues related to politics. In fact, what I'm most concerned about is issues related to the truth of God's word. Basic fundamental truth from God's word will get you canceled. It will get you off, ostracized, fired, all manner of things just because you take the position or believe something in accordance with God's word that somebody else says you, that's not what's okay in the public space for you to think, okay? Now, Daryl and I joked, hang on one second. My throat's a little bit dry this morning. We joked when we could not get into the PayPal account that we'd been canceled. And I said, now that'll come after today's message, okay? But I want you to think about this, okay? Was Paul an ambassador of Christ? Was he sent out in the first century world to be an ambassador? And so as I've thought about this issue, I've seen this issue a lot. People have a lot of thoughts and opinions, and I've talked to a lot of people, listened to a lot of things, uh, talk to people in person, listening to podcasts, to different, to different things about this issue, and people have all kinds of ideas about it. And as I'm thinking about it from the point of view of Scripture, and how does this affect me or impact me as a believer, as, as somebody who's endeavoring to carry forth an ambassadorship to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, you, it doesn't take long for you to realize that you believe things, that you stand for things, that will, be, that will get you on the cancel list lickety-split if you're going to stick with the Word of God. The whole idea that, that, um, of absolute truth, the whole idea that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and that salvation is only available through His atoning work is 
something that is going to be viewed as hateful, okay? It's going to be viewed as exclusive. It's going to be viewed as not open-minded, so to speak, out there in the public space and in the marketplace of ideas. And those are things that I believe, that I preach, that I teach as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ and his atoning death on the cross and resurrection are the only ways of what? Salvation. And there's an idea out there that says, well, that's your truth. I speak my truth. My truth is different from yours. And we're all just supposed to accept all this as what? True. Okay? So I got to thinking about this, and two passages from the book of Acts came to mind. And I want to share these passages with you from the point of view of this conversation. And I want, as we go through them, I want you to think about these passages in the following way. What is the reaction of the people to the truth? What is the reaction of the people involved in the story to the truth? Okay? And I want you to think about it from that point of view. So let's start with Acts 17 and we'll get start at verse 15. Now, by the way, I have talked about the issue of truth in the past. I'm going to talk about it slightly differently starting this morning than maybe I have in the past as we start to think about this issue of truth and censorship in post-Athenian America. Now, the title is coming out of Acts 17. In Acts 17, Paul is on Mars Hill in Athens. Look at verse 15. It says, And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come unto him with all speed, they departed. So Paul there in verse 15, is he dropped off and deposited in Athens? And is he there by himself for a while? Verse 16. Now, when Paul waited for them at Athens, so he's waiting for Timotheus and Silas there, he's waiting for them, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the whole city given to what? So as Paul is there all by his onesies walking around Athens, does he see a city that is totally given over to idolatry? And as a minister of the gospel, as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, is his spirit stirred within him as he observes and witnesses all of this? Okay, next verse, verse 17. Therefore, so because of his spirit being stirred uh, on account of their idolatry in the previous verse, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons in the market daily with them that met with him. So I want you to notice something else now about verse 17. There's two places where he's doing this. The first place is in the synagogue, right? Where's the second place? He's in the market. Is, in the, is he in the open-air public space where he's talking about the gospel, okay? He's, yes, he's in the synagogue in that verse, but he is also doing it publicly, not behind closed doors, not off in a corner, not some, not some place where nobody knows what's going on, but he's doing it openly in the market, which I think is interesting in and of itself because the market is where people go to what? Exchange, Right? Most often economic exchange, but people talk about, and I use the term a lot myself, I talk about the marketplace of ideas, right? And out there, is there an exchange that happens on a daily basis in the realm of ideas, all right? So Paul, he is moved, he's there, and he's going to allege and dispute in the synagogue with the Jews, and then also in the marketplace daily. So he's not doing this, you know, every once in a blue moon, he's doing this every day. Verse 18, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. So just stop there. Inevitably, Athens being the center of Greek classical philosophy, is Paul going to encounter some philosophers as he's alleging out of the marketplace daily? Verse 18, then certain of the philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So I want you to stop there and think about what's going on here, okay? Are they hearing Paul preach? And is Paul talking about some things that they hadn't thought about? Are they encountering some new ideas through listening to Paul preach that they had not encountered before? Okay? What is their reaction to the new ideas? Is their reaction to shut him down, lock him up, don't let him talk? Is that their reaction? No, their reaction is, we want to what? We want to hear more, okay? 
Verse, uh, verse 19, and they took him and brought him unto the Argibus, saying, May we know what new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. So not only do they hear him and want to know more, but do they put him into a more public setting where he could be heard by more people. You following me here? Okay. So they are not moving to shut Paul and his preaching down. They are moving to expose more people to hear what Paul has to say. Now, that is important. Look at the next verse. Um, ver, uh, verse 20, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know, therefore, what these things mean. So they, they bring him to the argument there in verse, in verse 19. They, they want to know what his new doctrine is, what he's talking about. They acknowledge in verse 20 that he's bringing forth some strange things uh, to their ears that they haven't necessarily heard before, and do they want to know more? And now look at the parentheses in verse 21. For the Athenians and strangers which were there spent all their time in nothing else except to what? To hear and to tell of somewhat. Are they very open-minded to what they are listening to? It says they are. Okay? Paul, being an ambassador of Christ, is he more than willing to take advantage of the opportunity given to him now to preach the gospel to the city of Athens, right? But I want you to notice their response. Their response upon hearing this is not to shut him down. In fact, they're so open about this that they're willing to hear what? Anything that he has to say. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to believe it, but are they willing to listen? Are they willing to hear it? The culture of Athens, as superstitious, look at the next verse, verse 22, then Paul said in the midst of Mars Hill and said unto them, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are two what? Now, the Athenians are like one extreme end of the spectrum, right? Where they're so superstitious about everything. But the thing I want you to see about the Athenians is, are they willing to listen? They're not just shutting Paul down, they're willing to listen to what he has to say. Verse uh, 23, and as I passed by and, and behold, beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I what? Let me ask you a question, how open are the Athenians? The Athenians are so open and superstitious that they're willing to make a statue to, a, if there's any God out there that we don't know about, let's make sure we have our base covered. Okay? Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me here. They're behaving as, as pagan, idol-worshiping Gentiles, right? What I want you to see, though, is their response to the information. Are they willing to listen to what Paul has to say? Now, they might dismiss it, and in fact, if you jump with me now to the end of the chapter, jump with me over to verse 30. We're not going to read all the contents there of Paul's message there. I want you to jump to the end, verse 30. Paul says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world by righteousness, by that man whom ye hath or uh, whom he hath ordained, whereof he was given assurance unto, hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now look at verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, they locked him up and threw him in jail and threw away the key. Is that what it says? No, what'd they do? Some mocked. So response number one is some did what? They made fun of it. They mocked him. They made fun of it, okay? Would you expect that some pagan, idol-worshipping Gentiles in Athens would, would laugh at him, all right? Some mocked. Others said, we will hear thee again on this matter. That's a second response. A second response is, that's interesting. I need to what? I need to think about that. But are they willing to listen and give it thought, all right? And then we see a third response, verse 33 well, verse 32, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, others said, we will hear thee again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them, Howbeit, certain men clave unto him, and what? Believed. 
Now, folks, I think there's a lesson there. If you take nothing else from this message, anytime you preach the gospel, those are going to be your three responses. You're going to get the response of those that are mockers and scoffers and who are going to make fun of you for believing something so stupid as that somebody in Bronze Century, uh, you know, Bronze Age Palestine would be tortured to death by the Romans and resurrected from the dead, and you're going to believe that. So your first response is going to be mockers. Your second response is going to be people who are like, hmm, that's interesting. I've not thought about that before, and they're going to need some more what? Some more time to think about it. And then the third response is those that hear it and do what? Believe. Verse 34, how, how be it certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was these guys whose names I can't pronounce. Okay, we'll just leave it at that. But my point is here, so I have a few points here. Number one, do the Athenians immediately shut Paul down when they hear new information? No. Are they open-minded to hear him out? As they're open-minded to hear him out, does Paul take advantage of the situation to preach to these people about Jesus and the resurrection? And does he do it in a way that is completely in line with what he's observing while he's there? And then at the end, they don't throw him in jail. They don't throw away the key. They allow for three natural, normal responses of mocking, giving it more thought, and those who do what? Believe. But the point is... Are the Athenians able to hear new information or contrary information without immediately shutting it down? Now we see a contrast to this. Come over to Acts 19. In Acts 19, Paul goes to Ephesus. <clears throat> Those of you who don't know, he's going to be preaching, and as he's preaching the sail enshrines to the great goddess Diana, the goddess of Ephesus, what's going to happen to the sail of the shrines? Is it going to increase or decrease? It's going to decrease, right? And so Demetrius, the head of the silversmith guild, is he going to have something to say about this? Okay, look at verse 23. So Paul's in Ephesus here in Acts 19, verse 23, and at the same time there arose no small stir about that way. What does that mean, there was no small stir? It means there was a big brouhaha. That's what it means. Okay? There's a huge problem now. Verse 24, and a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen when he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our what? Now here you go. How are they making their money? They're making their money by making shrines to the great goddess Diana and selling them, right? Now here along comes Paul, and he's preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's preaching against the Gentile idol worship, etc., and what's happening to their sale. Now how's Demetrius going to respond? Oh, it's okay, Paul. I mean, this is the marketplace of ideas. We want to hear all opinions. We want to hear all thoughts that are out there so that we can evaluate everything equally and make a decision about who has the most convincing arguments. You want to know something? You, you, do, if you're, you only mandate things when your arguments fail to persuade. You mandate things when your arguments fail to persuade because people by nature are receptive to arguments. And if you can make good arguments based upon good information to, per, to, to persuade people to do things, people will do things because it makes sense for them to what? To do those things, right? So here you, have, here you have Demetrius, and here he is looking at this situation. He's losing money, and he's not of the opinion of, oh, well, we need to just let Paul continue to preach. What is his reaction? we got to shut this guy down we got to cancel this guy. we got to censor this guy. we got to make him shut up because the longer he talks in the public square, what is happening to our income? It's going down. Verse 26. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus. Now look at his argument here. But almost all throughout all of the Internet. Wait, it doesn't say that, does it? Okay, sorry. Moreover, ye see and hear that uh, not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, that Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying, There be no gods which are made with hands. 
So listen, folks, if you are in the trade of selling idols, is Paul your best friend or your worst enemy? So what do you do with him? Shut him up. Cancel him. Shut him down. Don't let him preach. Verse 27. Now, look, do you, do, you, do you see the argument Demetrius is making? He's saying, this is the guy who's gone all through Asia preaching against idols, and now he's here, and we're going to what? Suffer. Economically suffer for it, right? Verse 27. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana. Democracy itself is threatened. Okay? What is his argument? If we let this guy keep going, what is going to happen? He is going to overturn the entire, the entire apple cart, political, social, economic structure of this whole what? This whole city. This is what he's saying. So that not only that this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana shall be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world, what? Worship. You see his argument here? And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath. Notice. Do they spend any time checking out whether what Demetrius is telling them is true? Or do they just have an immediate emotional reaction to what Demetrius is arguing here? Okay, verse 28. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. See, that's what it's talking about when it's said back there in verse 23 that there was no small stir. No small stir, as I said a minute ago, means there's a big brouhaha here, okay? And it's all instigated here by Demetrius. And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord on them into the theater. What's going on here? Do they want to shut this down? Do they have a very different reaction here in Ephesus than what Paul had in Athens? What did Paul encounter in Athens? He encountered a group of people who were at least willing to listen. They were at least willing to hear what he had to say. Some mocked. Some said, hmm, that's interesting. I need to think about that some more. And some did what? Some believed what he was saying. Here now in Ephesus, though, do we have a, an immediate movement to shut him down, cancel him, shut him up. Verse 30 and when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. So Paul's going to go in, and they're like, wait a minute, you better not. Probably a good idea, but anyway, verse 31. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried, out, uh, cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. Folks, is this an unruly mob? Taking mob action against Paul and his message and his companions. All stirred up by Demetrius and his arguments about what's going to happen to them if they continue to allow their, their trade, if they continue to allow Paul to preach. Some therefore cried, uh, verse... Um, uh, what verse was I on? 32. Some, there, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. Oh, man. If that doesn't ring bells with you with modern 21st century American culture, I don't know what's going to. They don't have any idea why they're even there, most of them, but they just know that they better get on board or they're going to end up on the wrong end of it. You see that? Now look, folks, what I'm saying, and I'm a, you need to hear me very clearly, what I'm saying here would apply to things on the right or things on the left of the political spectrum. Because there are people on both ends that are behaving this way. Just saying, I'm an equal opportunity, you know, 
instigator. But you see what's going on. Um, so verse 32, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. And the more part knew not whether they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews uh, putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with his hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, uh, all with one voice uh, came about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So now they're just, now, now they're just bellowing for two hours a mantra here. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians for two hours in their, in their anger and in their rage. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, now here it is. Notice that the authorities now appease them. Okay. He said, ye men, of, ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not that the that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana, and how an image which fell down from Jupiter, seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and to do nothing how. <laughs> it's a little ironic that he would say that, given what they've already what. Now, here is what I want you to, to zoom in on, on your thinking. Is the reaction at Ephesus totally different than the reaction at Athens. The reaction at Athens was open-minded. Let him speak. Let's hear what he has to say. Let's evaluate the arguments. Let's see if what he's saying is true. The reaction in Ephesus, though, is the complete opposite reaction, and it is a reaction that says, don't let him talk, don't let him speak, shut him down, don't listen to him because he's saying things that we don't want. Prove of. Okay? So Demetrius is attempting to cancel Paul. Now, here's where I want to take these stories. I want to make some application. During the Middle Ages, how did the Catholic Church treat or deal with people that dissented from Rome? Were they like, oh, you wonderful, loving Christians? We'll make a balcony so that you could sit in our church. Is that what they did? It's not what they did. What did they do? They unleashed hell on them. They hunted them down. They burned dissenters and heretics. They formed the Inquisition, a court of religious trial to execute, to, to convict and execute heretics, right? The Catholic Church creates an index of forbidden books that says you can't read these books, and if we catch you with these books, not only will we burn these books, but we'll also kill you probably, okay? So the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages, are they Ephesus or are they Athens? Fast forwarding, to America, America is the, is the product of Enlightenment rationalism, okay? Now, before you roll your eyes, you need to hear everything I'm going to say. Liberalism with a small L. I don't, when I say liberalism right now, I'm not talking about left-wing uh, political philosophy in modern-day America. I'm talking about true classical liberalism with a small l that maintained the belief in, number one, tolerance, religious tolerance, the right for you to choose to believe whatever religion you want it to be. Now you say, why would that have been a big deal? That would have been a big deal because coming out of the Middle Ages, was there a hierarchical domineering church that told people what they needed to believe? So was it a big deal to somebody in late 18th century or early 19th century France or England or America to be granted the right to choose what they wanted to believe for themselves? Okay? Second, the idea of freedom. So tolerance, tolerance being the idea that you allow people the right to choose what they're going to believe. Tolerance being the idea of freedom of religion. And the idea of freedom of speech. 
Those are all hallmark principles of liberalism with a small L. Not Again, I'm not talking about modern day you know, uh, political ideology. I'm talking about historical usage of liberalism and where it came from. It was in favor of free speech. It was in favor of freedom of religion. It was in favor of freedom of press and tolerance and these kinds of things, right? That's what it was in favor of. That's what it was about. Voltaire, God-hating atheist, this is what he said, though. He said, quote, I do not agree with a word you say but I will defend to the death your right to say it. This is small l liberalism. The idea, and that is indicative not of Ephesus, but of where? Athens. In my comparison that I'm making, Athens was the place where they had religious tolerance and freedom of speech. Athens was the place where they would listen to what Paul had to say without dragging him out into the theater to stone him. Athens was the place where they would allow for folks to be persuaded by ideas and arguments. And so you have people that mocked. You have people that needed to think about it more. You had people that believed, right? That was where that was going. So as we think about Athens versus Ephesus, and as we think about what, as we think about the ideas here that were that were birthed uh, through the Enlightenment age and and then into what would become the United States, we are talking about a society that would allow freedom of choice on issues related to belief and ideology in a way that they were not allowed during the Middle Ages under the Catholic Church. So this is going to mean then. That are there, is there going to be all manner of different ideas in society? Which means, are people going to disagree? So are they going to have to learn how to get along with each other in a society while granting each other the right to believe what they want to believe? Okay? What is happening right now through cancel culture, folks, is the emergence of a post-liberal society. A post-liberal society, and again by liberalism I mean small l, post-liberalism is dead. Where now what is happening is you are being dictated to about what you must believe, about how you must behave, about how you must think. And if you step out of the, the narrative that is being set, you are a terrible, awful human being and you need to be what? Canceled. This is post-liberal, this is post-Athenian. This is where we are. Even some liberal pundits on the left side of the political spectrum have taken note of this and are bemoaning it. Folks, if you haven't paid any attention to what like Bill Maher is saying, now you should. Bill Maher is looking at this situation. Bill Maher is an atheist, hates Christianity, thinks Christians are dumb, foolish people. But as he's looking at what is going on, is he bemoaning the fact that we are no longer allowed to choose for ourselves what to believe? Now, here we are, ambassadors of Jesus Christ, left here in Christ's stead, and we're supposed to minister the gospel in this cultural situation. Piers Morgan is another one. So the Enlightenment values of tolerance and freedom of speech are being under attack. And they're being redefined. So can I have the PowerPoint on the internet now? <coughs> in, 19, in 2006, Josh McDowell wrote a book called The Last Christian Generation. And I bought this book in 2006, and I read it. And at the time, when I read it, I'm like, there's no way that what this guy's saying is true. I pick it up some 15 years later and look at it, and I'm like, ooh, yikes, okay? One of the points he makes is that modern, postmodern culture has redefined words. And when people are talking, using words, they don't mean the way, they don't mean the same things anymore that they used to mean. And folks, this is a big problem with the whole topic of this conversation and that is there is a redefining of vocabulary and terminology underway as people are getting into this sort of postmodern thought process and mindset, okay? Now, I understand. 
I have just done three things that probably shouldn't be done in a sermon. I've taken scripture, philosophy, and now history, and I put them together and trying to do something that you guys can understand and get. I don't know, hopefully you're tracking with me and I'm making sense. I'm trying to communicate to you things that I've been thinking about, okay? And I'm not thinking about them from the point of view of, of politics. I'm thinking about them from the point of view of ministry. We are ambassadors and we have to find a way to share the truth of God's word in this crazy situation that we find ourselves in, okay? And part of it starts with understanding there's been a redefinition of terms. I hope you can see that. Or I maybe should have made it bigger. I don't know. Uh, I apologize if I didn't. But the first word is tolerance. Okay, whoops. Let me go back. I need to do one thing here quick. The first word is tolerance. Okay? So we have here traditional understanding and current cultural usage of the word. Tolerance, traditional understanding, would be accepting others without agreeing or sharing their beliefs or lifestyle choices. So in other words, traditional idea of tolerance is you grant somebody the right to believe what they want to believe, and they will grant you the right to believe what you want, want to believe. This is confused now in modern society, and the new usage of the word tolerance is the idea of accepting everyone's beliefs and lifestyles as all what? True. So you have your truth, and I have my truth. And who are you to tell me what my truth should be? Because truth is now determined not by an objective standard outside of yourself, but truth is determined now by your own subjective what? Opinion. A second word is respect. Traditional understanding. Giving due consideration to others, should say others, because a typo there, to others' beliefs and lifestyle choices without necessarily approving of them. Okay? Look, folks, there are certain lifestyle choices that I believe are wrong according to the Word of God. Okay? But does that person have the free will to choose to live that way if they want to? Will they be accountable to God for it? Yes. Okay? Okay? The traditional understanding of respect is to give consideration to others' beliefs and lifestyle choices without necessarily approving of them. This has been redefined to wholeheartedly approving others' beliefs and lifestyle choices. So it is not enough anymore to agree to disagree. Now, in modern 21st century culture, if you disagree with what somebody is choosing to do, you are by definition now a hateful person. Because they've changed the meanings of these words. Acceptance. The traditional understanding of acceptance is embracing other people for who they are, not necessarily for what they say or do. You accept them as they are. This has been redefined. Endorsing and even praising others for their beliefs and lifestyle choices. It's not enough to just agree to disagree if you don't give them a pat on the back and a high five for choosing to do whatever that thing is, you're not, you, you are now a, you are a part of the problem. You need to be canceled. Moral judgments. Traditional understanding. Certain things are morally right and wrong as determined by God. Folks, my beliefs about right and wrong are not the private subjective opinions of Brian Ross. They're the opinions of God's written word. That's where I go to for my understanding of what's right and wrong. Because any other standard is just completely subjective. But this has been redefined, right? We have, to in, in current cultural usage, we have no right to judge another person's view or behavior. Everything is all what? True. Everything is all permissible, regardless of what God says about it. Personal preference, preferences of color, food, clothing, uh, clothing style, hobbies, etc. are personally determined. That's the traditional understanding. The current cultural usage is that preferences of sexual behaviors, value systems, and beliefs are personally determined. So that's your truth. This is my truth. 
Personal rights. Everyone has the right to be treated justly under the law. Current cultural usage. Everyone has the right to do whatever he or she believes is best for themselves. Freedom. Traditional understanding, being free to do what you know you ought to do. You ever notice that all of morality, what's all of morality, guys, you need to listen to what I'm saying. All morality is, it is prescriptive. It's not descriptive. Okay? The Ten Commandments, do the Ten Commandments describe how people actually behave, or do they prescribe how people ought to behave? Okay, you understand the difference, right? If God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, is God advising heavily that if you engage in adultery, it will be negative experience for you? Yes. But you see, that is, but are there people that still commit adultery? So the injunction to not commit adultery is not descriptive of the way people actually behave. It's prescriptive of how they ought to what? Behave. In God's assessment of morality is lying, murder, stealing, adultery, etc., etc., are those wrong behaviors. So if I stand up and say that those things are wrong, it's not me saying it, it's me agreeing with who? With God. Now don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we're under the law today in the dispensation of grace as believers. That's not my point. But does Paul take the Ten Commandments and restate them under the language of grace? Yes. Does he say, let him that stole steal what? No more. But, la- but rather, let him labor with his hands, working that which is convenient. So is the morality behind thou shalt not steal still applying today in the dispensation of grace? But the motivation for it is different. Because it's coming out of an understanding of God's grace than it is God's judgment and wrath and punishment for not what? Not obeying. So we have freedom and the last is truth. Truth. Traditional understanding is an absolute standard for right and wrong. Modern cultural understanding, whatever is right for you. Just my truth. Take things that don't belong to me, just my truth. Hop in and out of bed with people I'm not married to, it's just my truth. Shack up with women in the village you're not married to, just my truth. You see, all of that is designed to escape accountability before Almighty God. Okay? And so now what's happening, go, go with me, if you would, to John. How long have I been preaching? Seems like it's been 10 minutes, but whatever. Go to John 18. John 18. <clears throat> so what's happening, guys, is we've moved past. We are in post-Athenian America. We are in post-small-l liberal America. We are living in a day and an age where if you think or believe something contrary to the narrative, the reaction is you need to be what? You need to be censored. You need to be closed down. You need to be canceled, okay? Because you are not kowtowing to whatever they're saying. And I am saying to you that that is so completely opposite of historically where we've been. Now, don't misunderstand me. Have a lot of really bad, sinful things been done? The answer is yes. Okay? They absolutely have been. But the whole idea of freedom... Go to... Go, go, before you do that, go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. The most fundamental basic thing that God does when he makes man in the earth is he gives him a will. He gives him volition. He gives him the right to choose 
what he will do, how he will act. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest... What's the next word? What's the next word? Freely eat. Folks, you can, I have that circled and underlined in my Bible. You cannot misjudge how important that is. Because God did not make man to be little automatons to just do whatever he said because he said it and he's God. God made man in the earth to have a will, to have a chooser, to have the ability to decide for himself what he was going to do. And God, from the beginning, he wanted men who would choose to serve him, who would choose to want to be with him, etc. And the same thing is true now. And here's the thing. Does the adversary know that God is ready, willing, and able to save anybody? Man, woman, child, uh, doesn't matter of your skin color, your race, your ethnicity. Is God willing to save any human being who will hear the gospel, the grace of God, believe and trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sin, was buried, and rose again, right? Is he willing to save anybody? Does the adversary know this? Is he seeking to oppose the truth? And his modern, the tactic he's using now is the tactic of Ephesus. Shut it down. Don't allow freedom of choice in the marketplace of ideas. Control the marketplace of ideas. Because if you allow the light of the gospel to shine in there, is there the chance somebody might hear it and get saved? Just like what happened in Athens. For John, I'm almost done. John 18. I mean, I'm almost done with this message. John 18. John 18. Some of you already know the verse I'm going to. Pilate is hearing the case against Jesus in this context. Verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore saith unto him, Art thou a king then? Pilate's like, Get to the point. Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world that thou should bear witness unto the truth. See, why is Jesus in the world? He's in the world to bear witness to what? The truth. Jesus says elsewhere, he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the what? Life. No man cometh unto the Father but by who? Me. Jesus, the truth claims of Jesus Christ are exclusive what does that mean? That means there is no other way of salvation outside of truth. But you have everybody out there in the media saying, well, my truth says otherwise. Who's right? Was God right? Or what's subjectively determined by the culture? Verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, art thou, uh, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born... And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Now look at Pilate. And Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? Now I don't know how you read that in your mind, but when I read that, I view that as a snarky, sarcastic statement that Pilate makes there. Oh yeah? Well, what is truth? What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Man, you need to study sometime what Pilate's really doing here. Pilate, Pilate is the most conniving politician that maybe ever lived and how he's trying to get off the hook for crucifying Christ. Maybe that's an Easter message. I'll just think about that. But see the question? What is truth? Go back to the previous chapter, 
John 17, verse 17. Well, verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy what? Folks, does absolute truth exist? Absolute truth exists and exists right here. Okay? I don't care what men's philosophy say. I don't care what their politics say. I don't care what their educational systems say. This is the truth. And I will tell you right now, and I mean this with all sincerity, right now, this is the only thing that I know for sure is true. Because I can listen to NPR and CNN, and I can listen to Wood Radio and Fox News, and I can get two totally different pictures of what is going on, and they both can't be right. Because they're opposite. And me, the dumb dolt that I am with a logical brain, I know that two things that are different can't be what? The same. And so I'm hearing all this stuff and I'm like, I don't know. I literally, and I mean it with all sincerity, I do not know who is telling the truth. And I don't know that any of you do either. The only thing that I know is true is this. And I will say another thing. The only thing that will manifest truth in our current society is time. Give it enough time and we'll figure out what was true and what wasn't. But the problem is, as we move through society at warp speed, nobody cares 18 months, two years from now about what was going on right now when nobody really knew what the truth was. And by the time it comes out, everyone's already on to the next thing, and nobody gives two hoots anymore. You follow what I'm saying? If you want an anchor to hold your soul to ultimate reality, the best solution I have for you is this book right here. End of discussion. Okay? End of it. I, I mean... It's the truth about politics. It's the truth about race. It's the truth about everything going on in our society is in this book right here. And our job, and see, the adversary, he wants us so enamored with all the stuff that we lose sight of what the real issue is and we we fail, therefore, to be ambassadors for Christ. Do we need to understand what's going on in the culture to be effective ambassadors? Yes, we do. Next Sunday, I'm going to talk about different views of truth and why they are not accurate, why they are not adequate, and I hope to ultimately get into with you proofs for why this book is true. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We're grateful for this opportunity we've had to talk about your word, to try to apply it to modern life that we deal with on a daily basis. We pray that it will be edifying and encouraging. We pray that it will be challenging to our thinking and that we can not be Ephesians about it, but be Athenians about it. Think about it. Uh, Be Bereans about it. Compare it to the Word of God. But we live in a society and a culture where you're not allowed to not toe the line, to not have a different opinion. Help us, Lord God Almighty, to be ambassadors for you in the midst of this mess. Help us to be able to know how to speak to people. Help us to be able to know how to how to take the truth of the Word of God and, 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 be, and be winsome and gracious and effective. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> well, hopefully that was worth the price of admission, which was free. So, if everybody will stand. Obviously-